Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshex mainframe channel. This is Moshex. And today we're going to be doing some cave exploration and go look for artifacts deep deep down in the IBM mainframe history. Uh, we're going to be looking at a listing that I received from one of the viewers of this channel and by looking at this ancient uh, 40 years old listing uh, we're going to be finding out a lot of things about the operating system, the application that was running, the job, and even the hardware configuration of the computer on which this uh, listing was produced. And so we're going to be having a lot of fun exploring the things that the operating system tells us when we look at uh, a listing at an output from a job. So uh, let's go and first of all, look at what we got in our hands here. So what you see here on your screens is a listing of about 50 pages that was sent to me by a viewer of this channel. I, black, I blacked out here uh, the name of the viewer so that uh, we don't have to, it's really not about the person who sent the, uh, the listing, it's about the listing itself. So that's, that's why I blacked it out. But this is the state of the listing as I received it uh, by FedEx just last week and um, this is how it looked you can see that it's a green stripe printout my uh, my uh, scanner in the office was not able to scan the the whole uh, print here because it's too wide you can see here some of the holes are still visible on the left side and then there's a little bit cut out on the right side but all the text is on the is in the scan. It's just the you don't see the cut out here. This part that you see here is also on the right side and the holes and the punch holes and those we don't see but everything else is on the screen. And so this is how it looked. It's obviously an old print. You can see from uh, the state of the of the paper that it's quite a bit yellowed uh, which gives a character. A little bit of artifacts here. A bit of uh, dirt but that's fine. And and the whole printout is in this kind of state. Um, I am very happy and very thankful to the person who sent me this listing. It's so precious to me for a whole number of reasons, which, which we'll find out during this video. So uh, first things first, this immediately looks to me like it was done on some kind of MVS related operating system or JS2 related operating system, even without looking at the details here, because this is how JS2 tends to print out things. The, there's probably above that there was one more page which is not present in this physical listing where you have the whole printout of the job number uh, in, in, in the big characters made out of the characters themselves you know what I'm talking about uh, we don't have that here but it must have been here but probably was torn off by the operator or the person who sent me this listing didn't think it was important and tore it off and so we're left here at the beginning of this printout. And right off the bat, we see here HASP2. Now, HASP2, if you followed any of my previous videos, you know that HASP stands for Houston Automatic Spooling Program version 2. And now, Houston Automatic Spooling Program is a software that was written by some NASA contractors in the 60s because they were, they had this uh, IBM 360 Model 75 at NASA. They had four of those here in, uh, in Houston and, and then two more in another location. And they were used throughout the Apollo program. Um, so Apollo program and IBM 360 Model 75 go kind of hand in hand. I know there was also a Model 95 somewhere there for, uh, because the 95 model was very good for flowing point calculations. But apart from that, this is what they were using. And they wanted to find a way to spool uh, output and input for the job so that, that they wouldn't have to wait for printers to become available. And so they wrote this HASP as a type three program. Uh, in IBM jargon, that means it's, it's, a, it's an employee or user contributed program that is at no cost and for which IBM assumed no responsibility whatsoever. So this was printed by HASP, which is the predecessor of JS2 as we all know. Then it tells us here about the class uh, that this job was run in, which is class A. And then this I know to be, if, if I look at, an, at a printout from another HASP2 um, uh, listing that I can produce because I have 
uh, th I have a version of HASP2 running and I also made a video about it. I will link in the description below this video. This is the name of the printer. So it says room three, printer two. So there must have been more than one printer in this room three. And so people knew that where they put, picked up this, uh, this printout. And then the job started, uh, job number 518. So it must have been the recent IPL. I would assume uh, it, the machine probably IPL at noon every day again. Uh, let's remember that those machines were not as reliable as modern mainframes. It wasn't unusual to have to restart those machines once or twice a week. Sometimes people preemptively restarted the machines once a day, once a day or even at the end of every shift. So, but we know this job ran at 1.34 p.m. So just afternoon. So that's what makes me think that they re-IPL'd the machine around noon because in those days batch jobs were dime a dozen and so 518 jobs in from the beginning of the shift in the day doesn't seem like like that, that's the way it was going it was probably re-IPL'd so this is all what we can infer from looking at this first few lines and then the interesting thing this ran almost exactly 40 years ago um, three weeks which is three weeks short of 12, April 12th so this ran exactly 40 years ago this printout their viewers is 40 years old. I'm sure that the vast majority of the viewers of this channel, because I know because of the Google Yahoo statistics, are in the age group 29 to 35. So uh, I think about 40% of the viewers are in that age group. And so for 40% of the users, of viewers of this channel, of this video right now, this printout is older than them. <laughs> and then room 4EA1, I would think this is the room where uh, this particular person who produced this output was sitting. And then here's a note number, probably related to remote job entry. Not sure about that. And then here's the print number again. So then um, let's go one down and start to find out more things. So what we can see here is that the user was N000100. And that makes me think, since we saw this also here, that this is the username of this user on this mainframe. Um, and then we have um, immediately, we have some accounting information. Actually, the class was N, but the message class was A. And this is what this refers to, message class A, this A here, that you see here and here. So this is printed with message class A. And this is a multi-step job. And this is HASP, or if you want, just to telling us some stuff, some stuff. And was, with this student, I know this was produced at a, at a college in Florida. So what the student did here is first define the sysprint, uh, sys out A, and then defined um, some uh, d data definition, which stood in student pack one on the 3330 um, IBM DASTA device. 3330s had, had uh, removable packs and that's why you have to specify this volume serial number as well. So there was a standard, a student pack mounted on this device, this position old. And, and then it ran this program called IH program, program Maintenance. So this is a maintenance job that allows you to define or delete certain uh, data sets from the system. So in this case, what he wanted to do is, uh, this is the system to this program. He wanted to scratch this data set instruction and WHP281, don't know what this stands for, on a 3330 DASD on the student pack one, and the member was prime. So he wanted to delete, first of all, this member from this partition data set. We know that member refers to this, and this is a data set, so it must have been a partition data set. Uh, I tried to Google what executor V2L3 stands for. I could not find any reference at all out there. So if any of the viewers know what this executor stood for, but immediately we get some very, very interesting information. So first of all, we know that this printout here, and that's what I exactly what I've been looking for, was printed on a 1403 printer. And what we can do here is that I scanned it as a PDF. We can actually, I always recognize 1403 Printout. This was um, the this printer existed actually before the IBM S360. It existed as the printer as part of the IBM 1401 
business computer, business mainframe that preceded the S360 by three or four or five years. And it was such a good and reliable printer that they took it over as part of the IBM S360 product family. It prints 1200 lines per minute. Um, if you had a reduced uh, belt, uh, font belt, you could go up to 600 uh, lines per minute. So very, very popular. And in fact, when I started programming on a mainframe in the 80s, I was producing my output on a 1403. And I always recognized the 1403 and the T's. The T's give it away. That's the font of the 1403. And by the way, there's a website where you can buy this font. And I do, and I did buy it. Cost about ninety dollars, and I produce all my output for my for my mainframe emulators using this font because I just love the font. You can recognize it very simple. The T was just a long line and the short uh, and the short horizontal line. No other artifacts in the font. Let's see if we can scan it even closer. Yeah, choose any T like this one. Now the T's and um, and uh, S. Uh, characters were over, over, always a little bit more worn down on the 1403 because there's a lot of S in, uh, in just two output and in other output. As you can see, the S was always a little bit worn out at, at their thicker part. <coughs> Very typical to see the S worn out here like this. The T also always a little bit worn out on the horizontal line. Um, I never figured out why the horizontal line wears out faster than the vertical line. Maybe some of the viewers have some explanation for that. And then the zero is obviously also more used. Um, although this zero here seems fine. This D is a little worn out here. But this is a very nice and classic example of a 1403 printout. And we see it because uh, this program here prints out the devices it's operating under and so we see a 1403. Then we see that this data set DEF sits on a 3330 uh, model 10 disk device which I think at the time was uh, capable of doing about if I'm not mistaken about 100 megabytes per disk pack and I think there were I have to look it up but if I'm not mistaken there were there were six platters inside the 3330 disk pack and then we have a card reader and that's how this student submitted his job to to this mainframe through the reader and it's a 2540 card reader which could also collate if I'm not mistaken and um, and uh, this is how this uh, job got into the system through a 2450 card reader so this is already uh, this, this is all the stuff that we can just glean from looking at this ancient output. And then uh, the next step is the student executed a, a COBOL compile link and, and execute, I would think, I don't know what the case, the link edit, I would think, uh, procedure, which must have been a store procedure. And, uh, and it was on this, um, on this system. And this is the compiler, which we know from the MBA, from TK4. If we look at TK4, the compiler is called IKFC COBOL, IKF COBOL 00, because we use the MVT compiler. So this gives it away that this must have been an MVT system, but we're going to go and look for more confirmation that, and in fact, we will be able to nail it down to an MVT uh, version 21.8, uh, but uh, we'll get there in a second. So then it executes this procedure, which has the COBOL compiler and an 88 kilobyte linkage editor. And by the way, this is the same linkage editor, which I found out to have by coincidence on the sys, on the compiler pack, on the mostly compiler pack, there is a data set there with a very old linkage editor, and it's the 88 kilobyte linkage editor from 40 years ago, which by mistake I executed on a modern ZOS, and they ran just fine, linked edit my COBOL program like like nothing and amazing. So I, I executed this exact linkage editor on a modern ZOS system and it ran without even coughing. So then we have some uh, CCUT. Those are the data sets that the COBOL compiler needs to do its job. And, and, uh, and then we have uh, the various definitions here. And this is, and then it took in the sys in for the COBOL compiler, 
and started to work on the source. Now, how do I know this is an MBT 21.8 um, operating system? So let's remember that M OS 360 came in three different flavors and you had to do a sysgen to choose the flavor. One was PCP, which was a very, very basic uh, supervisor just to run on very, in the very low end machines such as the S360 Model 30 which only had 32 kilobytes of memory 32 kilobytes of memory and um, and um, and so um, and then uh, you could go up to bigger machines and then the second flavor was MFT um, which was my, my multitasking uh, with fixed tasks or is it uh, multi-programming with fixed tasks so you could have you had to choose either at IPL or at SysGen how many fixed tasks you could run at the same time and the, the, the memory was, was partitioned this way and the, you couldn't change the partitioning uh, once the programs were running and then the same OS 360 could be SysGen into something called multi-programming with virtual uh, variable number of tasks MVT and MVT had at any time an initiator will pick up a job to run it would have to go and check if the region size specified in the JCL would uh, would make it fit inside the initiator size and if it would then it would load the program and execute it and if not you had to wait until more memory freed up but you could have virtual memory um, um, uh, the partitions within MVT and so this was the standard operating system for the larger machines, particularly was what was running at NASA uh, in Houston for the Apollo program. They were running MVT. Now, how do I know it's MVT? Now, you know that to this day, even ZOS, the latest version 2.3, whenever the operating system needs to allocate temporary data sets, like for instance here during the compile of this COBOL program, it, it has an, a naming convention. First thing it puts a system, and then it puts in the year, and then the day of the year, then it puts in the time to make it as unique as possible. And then it has the user and then some other naming here. And then it has this RV uh, and a number. I don't know what the number, where it takes the number for from, but I know that RV stands for MVT. Um, MFT, the other version of the operating system was RF. And I believe PCP was running RP. And then MBS came along and they changed this to RA. Why did they change it to RA with MBS 3.8? Because one of the many names for MBS during the development stage within IBM, uh, because at that point they only had MVT as a product name, that was the latest product name. So they, and they were thinking of calling it the advanced operating system. So they put in here RA. So if it's RA, um, you know it's either MBS and up, COS and everything else. But if it's V, it's MVT, and if it's F, it's uh, MFT. So, and this is how we know that this machine was running MVT. The only thing we don't know at this stage yet is what size of machine this was. If it was a three, I would think it's a 378 because it's 1978, must have been a 378. Could also already maybe have been a 3031 or 3033 um, processor. So here again, we see all the disk devices. These are the 3330 standard and the 3330-100. Um, two printers were existed here and these are the device numbers so we know how many of those existed. One, two, three. There were three disk devices, two print devices, two card readers. We don't see the tapes here but for sure there were tapes. This afterwards it does the linkage editor and again we get this whole temporary data set naming RV. Um, I would think that um, and then again it executes a different uh, and then it, it, the compile compile link and go and a different program load and execute the compile program and we see all this information here and so now um, this is the end of the execution now let's see here uh, this messages for step this is step 01 it executed this step in 0.14 seconds so that's the that's the scratch deleting of a data set which makes about sense it's about an eighth of a second for deleting a data set on a disk device 
the average seek time I think on that 3330 um, device was about uh, 50 or 60 milliseconds so that makes sense uh, it did quite a good job at deleting the data set and it issued about 661 IO instructions or execute channel programs to get this done and it took 30 kilobytes of memory to do that then we have the COBOL step which is of course quite a bit heavier compiled a program which we will see in the end and this took nine seconds oh, hold on a second so what are we looking here yeah no this took almost a second so now it makes more sense this took almost a second this step because it had to do um, this um, this deleting of the data set and this it took three seconds uh, and, and, and a half three and a half seconds and ran the whole compiler in 112 kilobytes of memory uh, think about how crazy this is three and a half seconds uh, to, to compile a program and and then the linkage editor ran in a quarter of a second didn't have to do that much so I would think you know from the speed of this machine it may have been a 370 145 or 168 I mean it's impossible to say for sure but it kind of feels to me like it could have been 145 or 168 um, mid to mid-sized uh, what well, 370 mainframe I've looked everywhere here I can't find any indication about the model itself anywhere and it would have been strange because it's obviously the operating system is independent of the size but um, this is kind of what I get from this so and then we get the um, this is the COBOL compiler that already process this is the output from the COBOL compiler step and here we get uh, get something interesting we see that uh, this is a um, COBOL OS COBOL 2 v4 release 1.4 from August 1st 1976 and um, and the interesting thing is that the COBOL compiler and we can actually go and look now in a software if we move this aside for a second we will be able to run the MVT compiler that's in our that's in um, in TK4 and see what version because it should be roughly the same compiler because we use MVT compilers in TK4 and why don't we just log in there and start an MVS instance YouTube so I did some stuff to it yesterday I don't trust this so I will just unzip again unzip so we have a brand new instance yeah Paul yes and then I go to the configuration and I make this a two CPU system so it's a little faster so we're eliminating a 3033 by the way I get asked I get this question asked all the time this model here has no meaning whatsoever to Hercules other than just being a string it reports so this has no meaning and also the CPU serial number has no meaning I can just change it to anything so but I'll make this two CPUs because MBS 308 supports two CPUs just fine and now we go to I got asked a question just today from a viewer why do I go to unattended what happens if I start this in in uh, not console mode if I set it in daemon mode um, which is and the only difference is that we will not have the console it just restarts and um, to interact with it you either have to go and take the web browser and go to port 8038 uh, or you have to use imon as i show as i was showing the video i posted uh previous to this one so but i do like to have the console so i set console mode done and now and by the way, if you don't know why something works a different way, just try it out. And if, it, if it's not working, just kill it. Unzip uh, TK4 again, and you're back again to, to where you were before. There's, there's no price for trying out things, uh, right? So let's start this mainframe here. And I'm gonna connect to it. So we can see and compare the versions of the COBOL compiler. They should be 
close to one another. We should have two CPUs here. Yes, two CPUs running. Let's wait. Okay, just who's up. And that's the version of Hasp that we just saw in the printout. That's what comes afterwards. Okay, here we are. Let's log in. And see you later is the password. And then let's go run a COBOL job, which we'll find in sys 2 jcl lib. Let's go down here, select any COBOL, compile a job. Let's change this to herc01 COBOL and class H, uppercase obviously, and let's run it, job one, and let's go look at the output, it's already finished, let's compare here. Okay, so this is interesting, very interesting that you see here, this is the COBOL compiler that we have installed in TK4, and that's May first 1972 level 78 version 2 and now let's look at what we have here this is version let's do it like this so we have here COBOL um, I don't know what this is but then we have your 2 version 4 this is version 2 version 4 version 2 Release 1.4 from August 1st, 76, and this is from May 1st, 72. So this COBOL compiler is about four years younger or newer, and um, and that's why I think um, it most probably was uh, either bug fixes or just some new features. I would have to go and do some deep research in, in understanding what was new, what was better in this compiler compared to the compiler we have in TK4. But it is an older compiler we have in TK4, um, just as an interesting site. And usually, you know, people will put in here, just like we did here, source computer IBM S360 and object computer IBM S360. But, and here, this programmer left out the description of what machine it is. That's where I was hoping to find the machine description. A lot of people did put in the machine description, but not in this case. And then we have a prime number generator here. So, a little math problem done in COBOL. And if I'm not mistaken, I oh know this is, uh, well, this is also prime number generator. <laughs> what about that? So, just different approach. Yeah, this is a prime number generator, just by coincidence. So, let's look here what the output here is in this case. This is, this, let's see how this looks like. It may not have been the same compiler options. Yeah, you don't have the exact same compiler options, but uh, but this is kind of the output from this. And um, let's see if we can recognize some of the, nope. Anyway, but uh, you get the idea. So this is very, very similar, just a little bit older compiler that we have. And this one was a little newer. And so this is all the information we can get out from, from just looking at an old uh, printout, an old listing. And um, this is a lot of fun for me. I hope it's also a lot of fun for you to look at this stuff. I like it. Um, now, if you have any listings, um, from any version, old listing from any version of operating system, from any of any age, uh, striped, non-striped, uh, of any size, I would either be very happy to buy from you for a very reasonable price. Obviously, uh, there's, it's not like you can't find this output; it's easy to find them. But um, I would like to either buy them from you, or if you could. Uh, if you could uh, lend it to me for a week or so, so I could produce uh, high-quality scans in my office, 
and then I'll make a video about your your output and uh, we'll go exploring and do some archaeology some listing uh, print out archaeology and find out anything we can from uh, from uh, from your output and see what you know what we can tell on what computer what kind of operating system versions what was particular about it what kind of devices were attached to the system we should be able to do similar things also with your output so I'll be very happy to do that uh, and I think for a lot of you it will be fun as well if you have any other information that you can get out from looking at uh, the output that I have here on the screen that I missed I'm sure there must be something uh, then please let me know and uh, I'll uh, pick it up again in one of my future videos but for now I think I will leave it at that and uh, and um, and uh, and uh, leave it here and uh, have fun looking at this a beautiful amazing listing which was actually gifted to me by this viewer so thank you very much to you out there in Florida I really appreciate it very much I, th I hope you had fun watching this video please uh, do consider subscribing to my channel to get notifications of future videos if you like this particular video please do press on the thumbs up button and see you soon back again on the Moshiks mainframe channel goodbye